Hi, my name is Graham Cathers and I'm one of the pastors at Believer's Church in Warren, Ohio. And I'm really excited to share with you guys today just some of my story. Uh, like a lot of you, um, you might have had children that you raised to serve God, but somehow they just kind of wandered very far from God. They're maybe today very far from God. And I know in my life, that was my story. My parents had raised us to love God. And at the end of the day, we were out there in the world partying, just kind of doing our own thing. But one thing that was really powerful that happened was my parents had began to see in the scriptures that God had given promises. And these promises were specific to their children and their children walking with God. And so my parents took a stand and they began to pray. And of course, there's much more to the story than that. But all these years later, three of their sons are pastors. And we're still believing for my sister who is inching closer to God every day. But God does respond to his promises. And that's one of the things that I wanna to do today is I just wanna share with you some encouraging words to help you connect with God because I do believe that we're called to live by the promises of God. And if you think about it, even our salvation, the whole idea of knowing that I'm going to heaven and that I am a child of God is based on the fact that I have believed and acted on one of his promises, that whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So today I'm just looking forward to kind of sharing my journey. Uh, and my journey really involves the, the journey of praying parents who love their kids and, and their hearts were broken over the fact that their kids were not walking with God. So today my hope is that you'll be encouraged uh, and, and not lose faith and just keep up the good fight. Welcome, welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to Crossing Paths Television Ministry. My name is Don Reed Sr., and we have wonderful people all the time, but we have a little lady, a new lady that's been coming part of Crossing Paths TV Ministry, and she's going to share and talk about the guests that she had brought here today. But, you know, I got a scripture here, and that's for everybody. That's not just for me or the people here on the set. You know, it says here in Acts 22, 15, For you will be his witness to all men of what you have seen and heard. And that was 41 some years ago when I seen, I heard, and I would not change my life today just to be able to sit here and tell people about Jesus. And then a joyous boy, we have a, a new different lady today, huh? Yes, we do. <laughs> we are blessed on to have Beth Bakun, a retired school teacher. I know you don't look old enough to be a retired <laughs> anything, but Beth, you have brought a wonderful friend. We've spent a few minutes talking to him, and I would like very much if you would introduce him to our viewing audience, please. Thank you, Joyce. Well, today I'm very excited to have you with us. Um, this is Pastor Graham from Believers in Warren, Ohio, and he has an amazing story to tell. Um, he's actually making two Bible stories come to life. <laughs> uh, so between uh, Jacob and the prodigal son, yes. I know the audience today is going to be blessed by your life story. Well, thank you. It's first of all an honor to be here with you guys. Thank you so much for the opportunity to share. Amen. Um, yeah, my life is really interesting. Uh, I have an interesting name. You don't hear it very often, Graham. At least yeah. growing up, uh, there weren't too many Grahams around. There was Graham Care, the Galloping Gourmet, and that was about it. Oh. And that's who not, I did not want to be him. <laughs> so. You learn how to fight really good when you're called graham crackers all the time. <laughs> so, so I was like, Mom, how did I get my name? I hate this name, you know? Uh -huh. and, and we're from Ireland. Uh, I was born in Belfast, Northern Ireland, and my family's from Ireland. And of course, in Ireland, it's not an uncommon name, mm -hmm. but it is in Southern California, which is where my family migrated to in 1963. Mm -hmm. So I didn't know the whole story, but both my parents were raised in families where there were no Christians. And uh, my dad uh, came out of the British Army uh, at the age of 22 after serving five years post-World War II. Mm -hmm. And my dad was with the Irish Guard, so he was the guy with the big bearskin hat. And so six wow. months out of the year, they would train in the uh, field with artillery, and then they would come and they would do parades. So my dad stood guard at the Tower of London, was in Queen Elizabeth's coronation many years ago as a young man. So an interesting guy, and he got saved in a Methodist church. And my mom uh, has a very interesting story. And I just talked to her, you know, yesterday to make sure I got the facts straight, you know, because sometimes you can just kind of start saying it so long that you're not sure that you're fact checked. So <laughs> I said, Mom, you got to tell me the story all over again. So my mom was uh, in a family with seven kids. Um, and one day a 12 year old friend of hers said, hey, you've got to come with me. There's a rally going on. It's called Youth for Christ. 
and they'd been going all through Europe. She said, there's a rally going on. I'd like you to come hear this young American evangelist. And so my mom went, and my mom just had a very open heart. She was a 12-year-old girl, and she walked down. And this evangelist sat her on his knee. Wow. And personally prayed with her to receive Jesus Christ. And he would later become known a few years later as Billy Graham. He so was unknown then. <laughs> and so she said, well, the reason uh, I named you Graham uh, was in honor of that moment and the man who led me to the Lord to honor that. And that's why you're called Graham. Mm. And so that's how I got my name. That's so amazing. she accepted Christ as a, a young girl. And because of that, it, now she's reaping, reaping the rewards. Was it like that for you? Or it, you want to tell us about your journey and yeah. how you, you got there? Well, you know, and it's funny because my mom was the only Christian in her family for many, many years. And, uh, you know, it's amazing. My mother is 80 years old now. My dad is 84. And my mom and my dad are just as passionate and on fire for God today as they've ever been. Uh, remarkable people. So my journey was a little different. And uh, because they were raised in homes where they didn't go to church, they assumed what a lot of people do. And what a lot of people assume is that, you know, if I just take my kids to church and kind of do the right thing and, and you know, expose them to, mm -hmm. to scriptures and prayer, well, you know, they're just going to make a choice to serve the Lord. That's true. And I would say that uh, in the church I was raised in, it was a really good church. Um, my older, my, I have one sister, she's the oldest, and then I have an older brother. And they both had been uh, saved and were baptized, but they quickly backslid. Unlike me, I was a little bit different. Now, the church I was in was sort of uh, based, it came out of the holiness camp. Mm -hmm. So let me give you an example of what I mean. We weren't allowed to go to the movies. So if I went to school and somebody saw Herbie the <laughs> Love Bug, I couldn't go see it. <laughs> My sister wanted to see Mary Poppins, and they were like, no, that's a sin. And so as a kid, you kind of say, well, I don't really understand why God would not want me to do that. Why and of course, we, we realized it wasn't a commandment of God. It was their personal take. Right. Somebody's personal conviction became a doctrine. But unfortunately, that became a stumbling block to me. So what happened was I saw the approach to God is that if I give my life to God, um, it's just going to become this boring life and I will not be allowed to do anything in life and I just don't want that. So mm -hmm. oddly enough, it's, I would hear these altar calls every Sunday and on many occasions I would feel the Holy Spirit convict me and I can remember saying, no, 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 I don't, I don't want to live this life. It's no fun. Mm -hmm. And uh, the closest I came was when I was eight years old and I remember as an eight-year-old, we always sat in the second to the last pew. You know, that's how you knew who was at church because we all had seats <laughs> and there were a lot of kids in my family. So mom and dad stayed in the back row. My dad was the worship leader. My mom was the, the person who led worship for Sunday school. My dad was a board member. They were heavily involved in the church. I had a drug problem. Even back then, they drug me to church Wednesday, <laughs> Sunday morning, Sunday night. They drug us to church all the time. So uh, anyways, I remember going all the way to the front row and sitting there and I had tears in my eye and I saw all these adults in those days, they would kneel down at the altar mm -hmm. and people would pray with them. And I don't know if they just thought, you know, he's a kid. Mm -hmm. But I remember sitting there and nobody approached me and I was mm -hmm. eight. And I just wandered back to the pew. It would be another 11 years before I would ever come back to that altar again. Wow. And so I really, over time, my heart became hardened towards God. And so although I was in church, I eventually saw my sister walk away from God. As she got older, she didn't have to go. I watched my older brother walk away from God. As he got older, he didn't have to go. Well, and I never had a relationship with God, but I was in a church. Mm -hmm. You know, you can be in church and not mm -hmm. be saved. Mm -hmm. yeah. Absolutely. And so I was one of those. It didn't mean that I didn't believe in what they were saying or respect mm -hmm. what they were saying. But I just said, that's not for me. I, I want to do one of those deathbed conversions mm -hmm. where I punch mm -hmm. my ticket for heaven just before I die because mm -hmm. I want to live the life that I choose. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm which is really a lie. Yeah. We don't live our own lives. You know, when we're in the kingdom of darkness, we're being mm -hmm. manipulated like mm -hmm. puppets. We think we're doing our own thing, but obviously there's a mastermind mm -hmm. behind that. So true. Right. So I thought I want to do my own thing. And, and so what happened was there came a point where all the older kids and my younger brother had actually accepted the Lord and was serving the Lord. But all of us older kids were walking away from God. We were far from God. 
And we were living lives that were dishonoring God. But you got involved in the real world then. It, I did. Unfortunately, you know, um, the school district that I grew up in, I was, I was raised in Los Angeles County. And, uh, you know, I mean, my high school class would have about 1,000 seniors, to 900 to 1,000 wow. seniors every year. And even back then in the 70s, our dropout rate was 50% at my high school. So I took my first hit of a joint when I was nine years old. Mm -hmm. I became a regular drug user at the age of 12. And I partied all the way through. You mm -hmm. know, I just did that. And that's what I lived for. And um, so I, my parents, something happened. My dad uh, and my mom, they were broken hearted. And, and maybe a lot of people out there in the audience can, can relate to uh -huh. that that feeling of like, you know, I raised my kids and, you know, God, did I do something wrong? What, what, what happened? I mean, my mm -hmm. kids have left the church. They, they seem to want to have nothing to do with God. Now my grandkids mm -hmm. are, are out of church and I'm trying to reach them for God. And, you know, what do I do? And so they were in a place where they were seeking God for answers. And so my father happened to pick up a book by a man by the name of Watchman Nee, oh, who'd boy. been martyred <laughs> for the Lord in China. Yes. And, uh, he began to read something that he'd never heard before. And you know, it's, it's hard to, to do something if you don't know what you should do. And of course, mm -hmm. they'd been praying for us since the day of our birth, mm -hmm. but to no avail, it seemed. And so my dad began to read this teaching and he, something went on the inside of him and it went like this, watch him in his book. He said, God saved Noah and his household. Mm -hmm. And then it said, God saved Rahab and her household. And when you look at Rahab, it's right. literally cousins and everyone. Mm -hmm. And then he goes to the New Testament and the Philippian jailer, jailer God saved him and his, his household. household. And a light went on and my dad just said, you know what, I'm going to pray. And so he opened his Bible to Acts 16, 31 in his office, stood on it. And he said, God, today I'm asking you to save my kids and I will never ask you to save them again. Doesn't mean he never prayed for us, but I'll never ask you to save them again because I'm asking you now based on your promise to save them. And he said, from this day forward, I'm going to thank you and praise you that they're in the kingdom and serving you. Amen. So Amen. what happened after that prayer? He, he, his, he was filled with faith. Your mother was filled with faith. Now begins the journey that you're still running Amen. from God. How did God catch you? Tell us how you, you mentioned before that a lot of people spoke into your life at that time. He did. I would just say one more thing. Uh, right when my dad prayed that prayer, he picked us up at school one day. My brother and I were actually had ditched school. We were high. And my dad turned to us and he said these words. He said, there's going to come a day when a team of horses with whips at their back will not be able to keep you guys out of church. And we laughed, but he got the last laugh. He's right, because we're all pastors now. Wow. So, so we're in church <laughs> all the time. I, you know, anyways, but you know what happened was is my older brother had come into the kingdom and I had an experience. And uh, when I was 18 years old, I was sitting in the back of a pickup truck with a bunch of friends watching a movie at a drive-in theater. We were drinking beer and smoking dope. And in my church, I'd never heard anybody say God talked to them before. Mm -hmm. But while I was sitting there, parting, not trying to hear anything, I heard a voice speak to me. It wasn't mm -hmm. audible because no one around me heard it. And the voice simply said this, you thought you had to be perfect before you came to me. But if you come to me, then you'll change. Mm -hmm. And I looked around and I said, where did that come from? Give me another beer quick. I'm going to try to <laughs> drink that voice away. And, but that began something happened because I think because I was raised in a holiness church where you had to work your way towards God. And you know, the gospel, the good news of the gospel is this. It's not about what I can do. It's about what he's already done. But somehow I had that mentality that I've got to be just right and so on. And God sort of himself kicked that prop out. And that started a one-year wrestling match. Oh. Mm -hmm. You know, Graham, recently we heard a sermon about the difference between hearing and listening. Mm. You heard from God, but in your heart you were listening too, weren't you? So there was already something planted down there yes. mm -hmm. from your past, from your parents, from whatever. It, it, it but was. you were listening. Yeah. And it was really interesting. And, and uh, as Beth was saying, um, God began to send me people, and I got to be honest with you, if I was sitting down as the programmer, I would say, 
why are you sending that person to Graham? Send someone else. <laughs> and you know what it was is I was, there was this pride when my family would invite me to church or my brothers would talk to, talk to me about God, I would lie to them and say, I'll never serve God. I'm not going to be like you guys. There was some kind of pride. So my family couldn't reach me, but God sent others to reach me. And I had coworkers and they would just sort of disarm me and say, so Graham, what do you believe in God? And I'd say, well, of course I do. And they'd say, well, what's holding you back? And I started to have, I had to think, well, what is holding me back? We had all these conversations. And then, um, you know, when you're wrestling with God, that's usually not a match that you can win. Mm. <laughs> and what happened was I had just turned 19 years old. I had been at a block party on the 4th of July where my boss actually gave me some kind of drug. I didn't even know what it was, but mm. suddenly I was barely functional. I, I got in a fight over a girl and I almost got stabbed and my friends whisked me away. And a few weeks later, I started drinking one morning. I was doing some landscaping for my aunt and uncle. Mm -hmm. And they were the typical Irish people who fed you beers. And I started drinking early that morning and I kept drinking through the night and I blacked out, which was not uncommon for me in those days. So mm -hmm. the, the crazy part was this. I woke up in the back seat of my friend's car with just a pair of shorts on. It looked like somebody had drugged me over a chain link fence. I was all torn up here, had a big old gash in my head. And I woke up with one thought in my mind. If you would have been stabbed last night and died, you would have woke up in hell. Wow. And it just dawned on me and I went home hungover and it's almost like I just said, God, I give up. I can't fight you anymore. <laughs> and my mom walked in the room and she said, you know, son, uh, so-and-so, a family friend of ours who was a year older than me, she said he died last night. And I said, well, ha what happened? She said he came out of a bar and wrapped his chopper around a telephone pole and died right on the street. And I made a decision that day. I said, I'm going to church next week and I'm going to give my life to Jesus. Wow. And so I told all my friends that I partied with, and a lot of them were from different backgrounds. I said, hey guys, this is the last week you'll ever get to party with me, so let's just party. <laughs> Let's do it as hard as we can, because come Sunday, I'm going to give my life to Jesus Christ. And they laughed at me. They said, you're nuts. You're crazy. They said, you'll last about two weeks. We know you. And so I got up on a Sunday morning, which shocked my family. They all started going to church. And I didn't even know where my brothers went, but I got in my pickup truck. I started following them on the freeways. They got to this church in Arlita, California. And my brother saw me in the parking lot and said, hey, you could pray and receive right here. And I said, no. I, well, they were already saved. They were already saved. My older brother had come in just one year before and he was radical like me. But I saw the joy he had and it was hard to deny. And so right there in the parking lot, I don't know if I should say this or not, but I just <laughs> said, guys, uh -huh. I'll never be able to do this again. Uh -huh. I said, so, and I cussed them out in the church parking lot. I just cussed <laughs> them out. I called them every foul thing I could. Uh -huh. And we went into church and this guy who had been a, an ex-heroin addict, a gangbanger from East LA who'd come from the nation of Nicaragua, had a really uh -huh. thick accent. He's now with, in heaven. His name was Pastor Omar Enriquez. And he preached with this accent. I don't think I understood anything he said. I was just waiting for the altar call. And at the very end, of that service, he said, glory to God, brothers. Is there anybody who wants to receive Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior today? And I said, that's me. And so he said, come on up here, brother. And so we prayed the prayer to receive Jesus Christ. And uh, that was August 3rd, 1980. And I can tell you that was the best day of my new life. That's the day you put down the bottle and picked up the Bible. Huh? Absolutely. And you never oh, drank absolutely. since then? You know, I, I have a couple of testimonies about that. I was really tempted to drink quite a bit in the first three months. Mm -hmm. And um, I actually shared this recently in a message. And the way I got cured wasn't the typical way. I just one night, uh, I found my best friend who I'd led to the Lord. Mm -hmm. And uh, I said, you know, I said, I don't want to be a hypocrite but I'm really struggling to live out Christianity. Mm -hmm. And I feel, I feel guilty all the time, and I feel like I'm always asking God to forgive me. And he goes, me too. Of course, I didn't know that the enemy was accusing me, and I right. didn't know he was condemning me. Right. Conviction draws us to God. Mm -hmm. Condemnation pushes us away. But I was feeling condemned. I, I was a young Christian. I didn't know how to fight it. So we went out that night. I said, let's go get drunk. And we did. We got drunk. But an amazing thing happened was I used to live for that. And the whole time we were drinking, all we could talk about was Jesus. And then we went 
to, and crashed a party drunk. I hate to say this. My first sermon was as a drunk evangelist. I preached the gospel <laughs> to a bunch of my friends drunk, gave an altar call. Nobody got saved. But that I night was a why. great discovery, was <laughs> this thing that was constantly tempting me. When I, when I actually got high, I said, hold on, is this what I used to live for? Because when I'm at church on a Friday night and I'm lifting my hands to God and the presence of God hits me, it trumps this so much. Right. It's so much greater, this new wine. And He is so much better Amen. than anything. And that was never a temptation again. And in my day, I'm a little older, but in my day they used to have a saying, it goes like this, there's no high like the most high. And we took that literally. <laughs> but that's when I, yeah, I've never drunk since then. So, so about three months that's, So that just yeah. shows you you can backslide. Right. I mean, we're, we're Christians under construction, you know. Yeah. I, I know time is running out here so fast, but you had told me something. They're, you know, raised in this holiness church and there's a good church and they've been preaching born again probably and, mm -hmm. and this religiosity, mm -hmm. that's the toughest spirit today is religiosity. Oh, yeah. You know, because I can do what I want, do I and go to heaven or uh, no matter what, what God's going to, you know, do this. Yeah. We've heard so many stories on these TV. Right. Now, there comes a time when maybe you were seeking additional power. Did something happen in your lifetime on this? Yeah, actually, um, you know, as you said, I was raised in a church where they really didn't talk much about the Holy Spirit was mentioned, but just as part of the Trinity. Um, and so when I went forward that day to receive Christ, um, I just went to be saved. I knew I needed to be mm -hmm. saved and I just couldn't take the wrestling with God anymore. And God certainly honored that. But the pastor laid his hands on my head and he prayed for me. Now, I didn't even know what he was praying for, but the moment he prayed, I felt something. And then he said, well, go ahead and praise the Lord, brother. And I thought, I don't know how to do that. So I just said, hallelujah. And he goes, no, not in English. And I'm thinking, I don't speak other languages. Uh -huh. And so what happened was he laid hands on me again and I, I felt this power and I just kind of said a few syllables. And then what happened was, on the way home, I began to talk with my younger brother who knew about this. He said, Graham, that's the Holy Spirit. And we began to talk about it. And there was this battle for a couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. I had coworkers who believed in it and coworkers didn't. And finally, one day I walked out and there was a guy that I worked with from the nation of Jordan. He was Palestinian. His name was Mazen. And unexplainably, as a baby Christian, two weeks old in the Lord, I thought I was making this stuff up that I was saying. I thought it was yabba dabba do, just gibberish. <laughs> but I looked at him and I said, Mazin, and I began to speak out those syllables that I thought I was making up. His eyes got as big as saucers and he said, who taught you how to speak Arabic? And I said, well, wow. what did I say? And he said, you were talking about the greater prophet. And it dawned on me that these words that I thought I was making <laughs> up were actually substantive words. It was they actually language. meant something. You know what I love about that? Because when the Holy Spirit was given to the disciples, when Jesus said, I go away, but I leave my spirit with you. And the, you know, the Holy Spirit came to the disciples. They went out and they preached in many different languages that they did not know. Right. And that's awesome because that makes a believer out of people that have any question about it. Yeah, it does. You it, just can't, you can't explain that. That's right. You can't, and you can't control it. I, I, I remember <laughs> saying, okay, let me try this now. And I would say something else. I said, what did I say? And he'd say, nothing. Mm -hmm. You know, so, so you can't control it. But it was definitely a sign to him and a sign to me right. because we did talk about Jesus. Well, Graham, what the does the Lord have you doing today? Bring us up to date today. Yes. So uh, mm -hmm. for the last 20 years, up until 2013, my wife mm -hmm. were worship leaders, associate pastors, and then lead pastors mm -hmm. for the last 12 years at a church in Los Angeles. Um, and through a series of events, God brought us to Warren, Ohio, which we now live in. And so I've been on staff at uh, Believer's Church in Warren, Ohio for uh, the last two and a half years. And now we're beginning to plant a church that will come Easter of 2017. Could you look into that camera now? There's somebody out there that they were raised in such a strict, I don't want to say anything against nothing being raised in a strict family, you know, because that's good. Yeah. But you can overdo it. You know, mm -hmm. and, 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 and the kids today are, don't want that, and I think sometimes it drives them away. You know, yeah. the parents mean it well. Does. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But, you know, that holiness, holiness, holiness sometimes is a little bit too much for some yeah. people. Now, just in the camera in one minute there, could you just, maybe there's somebody out there who's been through what you've been through. Absolutely. You know, the thing about the gospel is it's called the good news. Right. And there's a couple of different approaches that you can have. And the mindset that I have, and I'm not saying that these people that preached in the church I grew up in intended for this to happen. But this is how it came through my filter is that 
if I want to please God, I've got to meet all of his standards and I've got to be this perfect person. And if I don't get it just quite right, you know, I'm, I'm on the naughty list. I'm not really going to be accepted by him. And when you think about the gospel and the good news of the gospel, it's really just the opposite of that. Because the gospel and the good news of the gospel is not about what I can do, but about what he's already done. So salvation is not something to be achieved, but it's something to be received. And so my encouragement would be simply this, that if you were raised in a way where you felt like it was kind of impossible to live up to this holy standard, that you would just simply, you know, realize that that is not the message of the gospel, that the gospel is simply that God loves you and it is a, this salvation is a gift. You can't, if you work for something, by definition, it's no longer a gift. Mm -hmm. You can just receive a gift and that's what I did. And so today, if you'd like to receive that gift, I can honestly tell you that if you act on the promise of God, which simply says this, whoever calls on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ um, shall be saved. Hallelujah. Then Thank God you. will do that for you. Thank you, brother, for coming over here and taking time. Beth, first time on TV, am I right? <laughs> Was this uh, Christianity? Kind of. Close. <laughs> yeah. Well, it doesn't matter. Okay. And, uh, but, you know, I, I'm just sitting here realizing, too, that Thank God you had godly parents. Mm -hmm. It says in Proverbs, try to train up a child in the ways of the Lord, right? And we all know that too, you know. And there's probably somebody out there today, whoever you are, we have a telephone number. It's 724-981-7777 or 1-855-981-9777. If you want to receive the Lord or know more about the Lord or a church we can refer you to, please call us, okay? We have free Bibles. We'll give you a free Bible. If you don't have a Bible, we'll direct you the best we can. We have people answering the phone at all times. <coughs> Our ministry <coughs> is self-sufficient here. We really, really rely on people out there who have watched us and prayed for us and helped us and prayed for me and Joyce and sent some funds in. So you could, if you enjoyed this show, we'd appreciate any help you could do. <clears throat> Just remember, mm -hmm. God loves you, and He loves you, and I'm telling you, if He can do it for me, a former drunk, alcoholic, whatever, He can do it for you. Don't forget the telephone number is on the screen now. God loves you. And just remember, tell somebody that Jesus is real. God bless you. We love you.